Hello everyone, Mike with Spray Jones coming to you with another video and this is going to be a huge subject, very important and may require a follow-up video down the road. Is spray foam insulation toxic? Now, I have been doing quite a bit of research on this and this is going to be a very technical video. I'm going to keep it as much in layman terms so that everybody can understand it as much as possible, but you're going to have to stick with me on a few things because I'm going to answer a lot of questions you'll lay down in the comments in this video. So stick with me. I want to say thank you to all of the new subscribers and the old subscribers. Your support is huge. I appreciate it. Check out the playlists and uh, I'm going to be launching a lot of information between now and springtime so that people can make educated decisions for their builds this year. Okay, on to the toxicity question. All right, the first thing that we have got to get straight is that we are using wrong language in the industry. We are not going to refer to off-gassing, all right? That is um, incorrect language for what is going on. What we need to be discussing is low emitting material of VOCs, volatile organic compounds. It's not does the product off gas, it is what is the emission of volatile organic compounds. So here's the technical data sheet on the wall tight BASF two pound closed cell medium density foam. This is utilizing the new uh, well, new to us, but the HFO blowing agent, which is the new mandatory chemistry. You'll notice here that we've got a bunch of Green Guard certifications for indoor air quality. We're going to come back to that in a little while in this discussion, but I want you to see the physical properties here and look at time for reoccupancy right here. Time to occupancy. 24 hours according to a CAN ULC S774 test standard. Now, this is a Canadian designation. We, in Canada, we test to CAN ULC and we test for volatile organic compounds. Now, the U.S. is in the process of catching up. Now, I made a call to BASF and I spoke with one of the top chemists. I spoke with Chris, and Chris and I have known each other for quite a long time. In fact, when I got on the cell phone with him, he said, Hey, Mike, how you doing? I haven't spoken with you in ages. And I told him that I was preparing this video, and I made two pages worth of notes of what he had to say, given this topic. In the U.S., there is going to be a new standard that they are going to agree upon for first the actual uh, foam installation and foam product, medium density, high density, and open cell. So there's going to be an ASTM, I believe he referenced 1029 was the number. Correct, he referenced ASTM 1029 coming for the codes in the US. This will be similar to our already existing master standard for CAN ULC 705.1. Added to that standard, he said, once they agree upon the standard, the second thing that they will agree upon then is off, um, sorry, almost said it, off gas, will be volatile organic compound testing. So let's see exactly what the chemistry is on the spray foam so you understand it, what's going on, and then let's take a look at what is being tested so that we can see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, I made this little um, diagram, so don't laugh at it too hard. Here you have your isocyanate and your resin. This is the hardening agent and this is the actual chemistry of the foam that you are paying money for. The cell structure and the insulation that you want in your walls is all found in the B material. The A material, the isocyanate, just hardens it. Now before you go off on isocyanates, understand that they're used in the product Loctite and most major plywood manufacturers are using isocyanates to glue the sheets together in the plant. So this product is mixed one to one by volume, equal parts volumetrically of A and B. When they come together, they form heat. Now normally we put heat into the product, 
to help speed this reaction up, but without adding any heat, if you were to pot mix it or mix it by hand, heat would be formed, and that's exothermic reaction due to the polyols polymerizing and chains of molecules linking up and forming uh, multiple structures, forming the plastic. That heat given off affects a blowing agent that is inside the resin in a liquid state and it causes a phase change to happen and it goes from liquid to gas and as it gases it's going to puff open and blow open the cells that we want so that instead of a hard plastic like a truck box coating or an epoxy coating on the floor instead we're going to have a cellular plastic now the governor and the initiator for the speed of that chemical reaction is our catalyst. It's mixed in right in the middle with the blowing agent uh, as well as other products inside there such as fire, retardants, surfactants, um, and plasticizers. So the catalyst, think of it as the gas pedal in your car and the brake. You can either speed the reaction up or you can slow the reaction down and retard it. So the catalyst mediates and governs uh, how quickly it's going to convert from liquid to gas to cell structure. The cell structure is going to be trapped inside the plastic, inside the polyols, and it's those cells with that gas trapped inside the, the cell structure that we want inside our foam. And that's what causes it to rise and then to set into place to have the final product that we want. So that's the entire chemistry of what's going on. Obviously, we need to be one-to-one -one in ratio. If we have too much B or resin, we call that resin-rich. And if we have too much isocyanate, that's iso-rich. If we are off ratio, if we had two-to-one or three-to-one, well, then it's not going to cure. The product chemistry-wise is designed to have equal parts of A and B. And when they meet with the right amount of blowing agent and the right amount of catalyst, then you have the final product which is meeting all of the physical properties that you the consumer the building owner the homeowner want in your foam we do not do anything with the chemistry we can't add to it we can't take away from it we don't do anything but tear the seal off the drum stick the drum pump into it and then begin spraying we cannot thin the ratio out we cannot add something to it trim it change it top it up with a garden hose none of it it either works or it doesn't and it's very straightforward with the equipment the equipment is either pumping it atomizing it and spraying it or it's not it's making sludge so if something is off ratio you're going to have a problem or if something happens within the chemistry or the catalyst, then it would affect the cell structure and obviously the potential for these products, none of which you want to consume on your own. You're not going to want to eat or smell or drink blowing agent or catalyst. These individual components are not edible for consumption. That's a no-brainer. But when they are designed to work as a unit, as the entire chemistry is designed, they are to be neutralized and inert and do no harm to you when the final product is cured and in place. So now we want to study and test when the final product is cured and in place are any of these pieces, these components that go into the chemistry going to be leaking back out into the surrounding airspace and that's where we get into using ASTM and CAN-ULC to test for that. Now this will be a little bit technical, but I think that it's worth understanding what they're testing for and why and how the tests are set up. And I promise you, if you stick with me on this, we're going to go into, after this is over, we're going to go into what can go wrong, how it's detected, and what to do about it. All right, so in America, you don't have this test. You're going to eventually have your version of it, but you don't have it. So you're at a Disadvantage because majority of the foams, unless they voluntarily test to a standard, they don't have results. So you as the consumer aren't going to know what you're getting, whether the foam could be giving you VOCs once you come back into the structure or not. Unless you test for it, you don't know what you're getting. Right. So let's go over what the Canadian standards test for 
and something similar will be coming to America. ASTM sets up what equipment is used, right? ULC sets up how the test should be constructed with that equipment and thereby what is the data that's going to be created. So here we read just a little brief summary. It says, um, standard test method for the determination of volatile organic compound emissions from polyurethane foam. This standard has been developed for the assessment of VOC compound emissions from polyurethane foam materials used in residential and non-residential occupancies. It outlines a test procedure for the determination of volatile organic compounds from the specimen and explains why certain test conditions have been selected. This laboratory test method is based on, here it is, ASTM D5116 and D8142, which describes a procedure using small-scale environmental chambers to determine VOCs emissions from a variety of materials, including spray polyurethane foam insulation. Now, let's skip down as they keep describing what the test is about, and I know it it might be interesting to some but the majority will find it boring and this is the most modern test this is March of 2020 so it supersedes the test that they've had in place for many many years but here's the part that I want you to see a requirement of can you will see 7 10.1 and on and on and on is the volatile organic compound shall be tested in accordance with the 774 standard laboratory guide for determining of VOC compound emissions of polyurethane foam and the amount of time required for the indoor air concentrations to reach 1 one hundredth of the TLV or threshold limit value for any VOCs be declared. This is an extremely important test to be conducted as this is a health and safety issue for the occupants of a home or building. Simply put, nobody can say that the material does not off-gas VOCs without doing the proper testing, which is what I just told you, right? Now, scrolling down to what they are actually doing in the test, the Canadian standard specifies procedures for measuring VOC emissions of spray polyurethane foam insulation periodically over a 30 days following the product application. Chamber tests are conducted at assumed worst case scenario conditions of 40 degrees centigrade and 50% relative humidity. The data are assessed by toxicologists to uh, estimate safe building re-entry and reoccupancy. Now those are two different words re-entry and reoccupancy. We're going to come to that here in a few minutes. This testing is required by Canadian Construction Materials Centre CCMC to demonstrate the conformity of spray polyurethane foam products to the National Building Code of Canada and to Canadian Provincial Building Codes. So here's my notes from my conversation with Chris at BASF. The test is conducted in this way. They have a witness. You set out and they spray the closed cell sample. The sample is then collected and sealed in a mar mylar bag and then taken to the testing facility. It's then scheduled to be opened on the anniversary time of when the test was sprayed. So when you reach the 24 hours of when you did the test, that's when the bag is opened and then they start doing their measurements. Now, some interesting information to know is that within one hour of the test starting, he told me that they cannot detect isocyanates, catalysts, and fire retardants after one hour. And that's with it being ventilated. They're actually doing a 0.3 air change in the test chamber. And he noted some very interesting things. He said that the that in a closed cell format, the foams are the cells of the foam are little vacuums, and that they are not releasing their their airtight little bubbles, well, a, a vacuum, and that it's actually drawing the chemicals inward, not expelling the pieces outward. Now the test lasts; the first initial part of the test lasts for 24 hours, and that's why the data states reoccupancy at 24 hours. Why? because the initial test is done and that they are not detecting any VOCs within a 24-hour period. Hence, they set the reoccupancy. Now, reoccupancy is you coming back into your house, 
to live. Reentry is construction. Reentry is new construction or a large building where people are not living, they're just working. And the reason that reentry is much faster than the 24 hours is that within the first hour, they can't detect the ISO, the catalysts, and the fire retardants. So he said the data is clear. We can see that it's not anywhere near uh, harmful levels at all and that it's, it's nearly zero. But to bring things down 100% to the 1 100th that, that they mentioned, they are concluding that test at the 24-hour mark. So if you have gotten to the 1 100th by the time that the test ends, then you're certified, good to go, and you have reoccupancy set for people at one or one twenty twenty four hour period. Now, something to interesting to know about this reoccupancy. The other thing Chris mentioned to me is that the reason that they've left it at twenty four hours, because I asked him, I said, listen, and we know that the parts per million are going to be way down after an hour and after two or three or even twelve hours. It's got to be really low. And he said, you're absolutely right. But the reason that they have set it at twenty four hours is for the risk of the client, the customer that's living at the residence, coming back into the structure while they are still working. So what they do is they just set it as 24 hours and say, look, be gone for 24 hours. So you're not here for a 24 hour period while we're installing and thereby after. So that there's no risk of you coming in unprotected whatsoever when it's being atomized and sprayed and worked with. A really good rule to follow, uh, it's part of the mandate but isolate and ventilate so isolation is sealing things off closing things so he said you know you can have somebody upstairs in the house you're spraying in the basement but the basement is totally sealed off from the rest of the house shut off the furnace things aren't sucking air and putting it upstairs the door to downstairs is closed or you pull, build a poly wall and then you ventilate down there so you're giving maybe 20 10 20 30 air changes per hour of exhaust fan and drawing the smell out and during the whole COVID thing that's what we've done we've had a lot of people that have not been able to leave their homes while we're spraying a basement or parts of the home or room in the home that's under renovation and that's what we've done the people have been there and we've isolated them moved them to the furthest part away uh, evacuated the air with a simple extraction fan that you can get at any um, hardware supply store for building materials and construction materials and sprayed and we haven't had a single problem yet because we had we sealed it off moved the people away and then gave the air somewhere to go which was safe and then they came back in after we had moved enough of the air out okay back to our chart here that i diagram that i made of the foam so we've seen what happens when everything goes right but what can go wrong why would foam smell Obviously, the manufacturers are not wanting to make a product that stinks. That would be counterproductive. And, and let's be clear, in the United States, there's a lot that do not, all right? Just because they don't have certain mandatory testing, most of them are testing now. I think the Demolec product is just to name one. Uh, and they can give you reoccupancy and, and tests and standards that they have. So there are lots of safe materials, but it's a reason to ask for your data sheet, know what you're going to be getting, and then following up that what you've agreed upon with your installer is going to in fact be installed and you don't get a bait and a switch on something that he got a deal on on Friday afternoon with a credit card, right? So the suppliers are not making a stinky product. When mixed one-to-one, -one, when mixed um, under the right conditions that it has been designed to work with, it's going to be just fine. So, the two most prevalent reasons that spray foam would or could smell and thereby fail the VOC test, right? So, if it's sprayed correctly, it's going to pass the VOC and you're not going to be affected. Doesn't get sprayed right, will fail the VOC test. If your ratio is off. Now, they make uh, equipment now, the new modern equipment is set up that it will shut you down if the ratio is off. There's an electronic sensor and if you go off ratio out of a set parameter of one to one, it just stops the machine from working and the installer has to quit. And he cannot 
get the machine back up and running until he rebalances and get it gets it going. Why it goes off ratio? It's going to be a supply problem or it's going to be a, a feed problem at the gun. There's going to be a restriction at the gun. Uh, or mechanically something is broken within the in, within the system. Now, not everybody is spraying that. Not everybody is using very expensive equipment. And this is where I have a bone to pick. I'm biased towards good training, apprenticeships, and expensive high quality equipment i do not believe in getting into this with thirty thousand dollar rig bought off the internet all right there's a lot of people that are creating um alternate pieces of equipment to get in on the the, the gold rush of spray foam growth and some of them aren't going to shut you down if you're off ratio some of them aren't going to have the the balances and the the corrections and the controls that are in place so if you're going to be buying a high quality rig with high quality equipment in it, you're probably going to have the modern methods of protection. But there's another thing that can happen. And from a chemistry standpoint, maybe you have or haven't heard of people saying, well, if they spray too thick, too quick, uh, the foam can stink. And I brought that up with Chris and I asked him, tell me what is going on with this, whether it, it really exists or not. Because the first and foremost thing that you notice when you spray too thick, too quick, is that the cells of the foam are stretched and the foam wants to crack or disbond. He said this is what's going on. The foam is designed to be sprayed in certain amount of lifts. So you've heard me talk about open cell foam can be sprayed to infinity but closed cell foam unless it's a high build product for years, decades really, 30 years in the industry, we can only put two inches on per pass because we'd build up too much of this exothermic heat over here on the left that would affect the blowing agent and then it would affect the cell structure because it would in essence be stretching it too much there's just too much liquid mass of chemistry and the cells would become stretched we now have high build products demilex got one bsf's got one other suppliers will be coming online where we can spray four five inches per pass safely because the chemistry is designed to do it but what if you took an old-fashioned product or a regular product and you sprayed it for five and six inches in one pass what would happen well you are creating so much exothermic heat you're activating so much blowing agent to go from a liquid to a gas that what Chris told me was you will change the catalyst you'll actually scorch the catalyst and you begin to break open the cells and fracture the cells and break down the polyols. You're actually destroying the chemistry, destroying the finished product, which makes sense. You're tearing it. And he said then that destruction of the cells, they're no longer sealed little vessels and you've charred the catalyst and the catalyst is breaking out and it hasn't been terminated, it's been altered and it's actually been changed he said the catalyst has changed via the heat and that now it's going to release into the atmosphere and he said something very interesting about this he says that our noses can detect far more sensitive amounts than the parts per million on a machine so he said a machine might not pick up enough voc that there's a problem that it would register on the machine on the data but your nose will and that's why you can walk into a building that's been sprayed far too thick too quick and it might have an odor to it because they have stretched the cells broken down the cells destroyed the polyol connections and you've terminated it you've you've killed the product now do not think that this is something that is on the razor's edge of happening just barely. This is not, hey, he's supposed to spray two inches and he sprayed two and a half or even three. We're talking about double. We're talking about you should have sprayed two and you sprayed four or you sprayed five and you sprayed six. Six is going to be three times beyond what you're supposed to be doing. So if you understand what's being said here now, the installer back to the number one reason why people get cheated the installer has absolutely violated the chemistry and they have taken the system far beyond because we're manufacturing let's be honest this is raw chemicals of a and b the final product the spray foam that you want to pay for right down here you're not getting that until we make it that way now we can't alter it but we have to combine A and B professionally and make the final product for you. So they have violated the manufacturing process and not given you the final product that your data sheet says you're supposed to have. 
other reasons besides off ratio and spraying way too thick too quick extreme thick too quick uh, if somebody was playing around with something uh, if they had added catalyst okay and I know that that can be done that's fraud that's illegal that's criminal activity you're playing with the chemistry and you're changing things it's not beyond I've I've heard of and known of spray foam companies to install outdated product that had expired I've known them to dye products to look a certain way to uh, be false that it was something that it wasn't so that the client didn't know what they were actually getting they were getting a lesser product but they thought visually that they were getting something else and uh, there's been people that have added uh, catalyst so catalyst is going to affect uh, your summer formulation, your fall formulation, and your winter formulation. So if you have leftover summer, um, it's supposed to either get sprayed out or you send it back to the factory. You are not supposed to go and source out Catalyst and play chemist in the back garage and dump a bunch of Catalyst and turn a summer foam into a winter foam and speed the reaction up. But there are unscrupulous people in all walks of life and uh, if somebody does that they could do something to the foam that will then thereby cause it to have an odor again this is a low emitting material low emitting VOC material when it is mixed on ratio with proper equipment properly installed to the standards very low emitting VOCs now to wrap up let's just take a look at the green guard certification if you are in a situation where you've had closed cell or open cell foam and uh, the product is still stinking stinks on hot days stinks when you've left the doors closed and the building shut and it's not going away it's not dissipating this isn't after a, view, a day or two or three this is after many many days and it's still continuing and continuing you've got a problem you need to stop uh, your build and you need to contact your installer and you need to get this rectified and in most situations most it could result in removal of the foam all right unless it's a specific area that they can isolate you don't have to remove all of the spray foam it could just be a patch or a section or an area uh, there are encapsulation methods similar to what we do with asbestos where asbestos is encapsulated and a, a coating is sprayed over top of the foam uh, that would seal it in uh, those are rare I'm not gonna make much comment on that I haven't had any experience with any of that and I don't plan to because uh, we try to install the foam within the standard so that we don't have issues now understanding trust the industry as a whole whether it's spray polyurethane foam carpeting flooring or particularly the bedding and mattress and cabinetry industry everybody is gravitating more and more towards off uh, off gassing or the smells the VOCs I should I should get my speech correct here the volatile organic compounds and as a result green guard indoor air quality certification is the thing of the future and I think this is something that you can absolutely trust folks if your product has been tested with this uh, strenuous and rigorous testing under these laboratory conditions I think then you you know that as long as the installers do their job that you're safe or the product that you're buying will be safe and then it's not going to be something where you're gonna wish you hadn't got it so just a quick overview here this is just a website showing a little bit uh, about green guard uh, it's talking about the EPA Americans on average spend 90% of their time indoors pollutants in indoor spaces can be five times denser than the out outside air and that they are these emissions happen when VOCs volatile organic compounds present in certain products break down at room temperature VOCs are carbon based materials which convert to gases and dissipate in the air there can be 50 to 100 different types of uh, VOCs indoor environment so they claim here that the uh, the program has two tiers of certification the green guard gold adheres to the even stricter standards of the standard green guard certification criteria um, skipping down here 
Green Guard Gold program includes rigorous standards of testing. Products are kept in a dynamic environmental chamber for one to two weeks. These chambers are temperature and humidity controlled. Stainless steel compartments ensuring no VOCs. After one week, the certifying agencies test the VOC levels in the chamber. If the emission levels are low, the product earns the products earn Green Guard Gold or Certigard, Green Guard certification mark. The UL Green Guard certification program tests for the following types of products: building materials, furniture and furnishings, electronic equipment, uh, cleaning and maintenance products, medical devices for breathing gas. Okay, coming back full circle, we're now completing here, done. BSF technical data sheet for the wall type product. If we scroll down to approvals and credentials, they are stating right here, one, radon gas control soil gas barrier, uh, meeting all of the standards for the material set out by ULC, low global warming product blowing agent that's the HFO right here made by Honeywell and then here you go Green Guard and Green Guard Gold certification meets the stringent requirements of Green Guard Gold thus ensuring occupant safety through improved indoor air quality and eco logo for uh, sustainability so here's your Green Guard uh, Gold and Green Guard standard certifications I have been using this product for 16 years I've gone through three different chemistry changes with BASF and they are top, top shelf chemists. Um, sometimes there's a few tweaks along the way to get it even better than the first version, but I've not had a problem in 16 years of business with odor. And I have good installers that follow the rules. Uh, it's not hard. We pay them well. We take care of them. They understand what needs to be done. They take pride in their work and they give the end client a good product and the clients we try to educate them prior to the installation as to what they're going to be getting how it's going to work what they should do to protect themselves but I've even had people that have come out that have been highly sensitive at other job sites sprayed by other products and came to ours and said you know let me let me check it out and in one situation uh, we had a gentleman walking through a building 20 minutes after we had finished spraying the foam like the the a hose was still out the guys were still wearing their gear you know they they were in a brand new house and they were surprised 20 minutes after the guys had finished spraying they can't smell anything so it's very very low odor and that's the way it's supposed to be and you the consumer should be getting an excellent product with no smell and know that the testing is in fact in place to certify and make things safe and then the people just have to hit their marks do it properly and everything will be fine. So I believe you can put your trust in closed cell foam and open cell foam. And to my American friends, help is on the way. You are going to be having your new standards soon and then you're going to have your off gas testing and I think this will spread like wildfire from state to state. I think it will become a mandatory requirement for certification in your county and in your state and then the consumers can see that all of the regs are being met and you'll have something that you can show the proof on and then it'll satisfy a lot more of the common uh, questions that you encounter. So I know this is a long video, but it's a huge subject and I, I appreciate you sticking it out this far. If you did make it this far, thank you very much. Comment on the video. I'd very much like to hear what you have to say and uh, hit subscribe, hit the like, hit the share with somebody that needs to see this and we'll be updating you with more information very soon. Have a good day.